Well, boys, looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. <laughs> We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom. Congratulations, you have found Double Feature. <laughs> uh, Michael Kester found Double Feature. I did, yeah. And my name is Eric. And no, uh, no, I can't leave. Your reward. <laughs> you're trapped here for at least 40 minutes, my friend. The uh, movies we're doing on the show today are Haywire and Centurion. Yep. But I feel, like, uh, I feel like in order to get into this show today, you need two pieces of information about the very show itself. Okay, so if I were to take a random stab at, yeah. uh, at Please. what those would be. Please. Um, the first would be uh, chapters that uh -huh. you can navigate through this podcast. This is great. This is great information. Um, much like Quintus Dias through the, uh, the wow. picked Badlands. Uh, can you tell after five years we're so fucking bored of giving the intro? <laughs> we're bored. I'm bored right now. I'm sorry. There's a chapters menu. You can go uh -huh. up, you can click, you can click again, and then bam, you're talking about Centurion. You're talking about Haywire. You're talking about next week. You can skip week. to other parts of the show. Who That's fucking great. Knows? That's Who a great cares? feature. And then if that's all you know, wonderful and great... Uh, spoilers. That's the other thing. We uh, spoilers spoil the on film. this show every week. Why we... didn't you tell me that two hundred fucking episodes I don't ago? Know. Every time, every uh, week, we spoil the films. We get a kick out of that's it. That's like four hundred us... fucking movies that yeah. have been spoiled for me. Yeah, spoiling the films puts us at half mast. So oh, we make sure to get it in at least <laughs> wait, once a week. What? Oh Jesus! Um, can we start talking about the movies? Yeah, Haywire is amazing. Haywire. I... Is... Yeah. Can I tell you something about Haywire? One thing. Well, I want to tell you one thing, and then we'll just move on to Centurion. Okay. That's not true at all. I'm going to tell you a million things about Haywire. Um, I hadn't seen this yet. Uh-huh. Now, this is all sorts of weird, because it's a Soderbergh movie. Yeah, that I saw in the theater. That you saw in the theater and then told me to see. Yeah. Haywire is my new favorite fucking thing ever. Yeah. I am in love with Haywire. Uh, oh, my God, is Haywire good. So, Soderbergh is this guy we talked about on the show We before. talked about him, yeah. We did um, the girlfriend experience. We did do the girlfriend experience. And his movies are perfect for the show, because there's a bunch of stuff to talk about. Yeah. It's always weird stuff. There's sure. just They're talk about me kind of movies. Sure. That's fine. Um, at any given point, I feel like this is this show is easy after a Soderbergh movie, because this is what you do after you go see a Soderbergh yeah, movie with somebody. Yeah, absolutely. But we talked about the girlfriend experience, totally different than the stuff from Haywire, but we did mention some of the same Soderbergh stuff. Yeah. The the kind of tendencies he has as a filmmaker. And so I don't want to rehash a lot of that. But he makes a lot of artistic smaller movies. Right. And he makes a lot of bigger budget movies that kind of finance those. Sure. And then do you get the feeling that Haywire is the first time he did that both at the same time? <laughs> <laughs> I think you know where I'm going with this. Yeah. All right. So listen, man. I, you know, and I try... Not to want to say that because uh -huh. that's obviously the thing about this movie. That is right? the thing about this movie. I well, there's hear... two big things about this movie <laughs> that I think are absolutely fantastic and bizarre. Spoil the other one for me, really quick. Uh, Gina Carano. Okay. Only good. female in the film. What? Think about it. Uh, whoa. Okay. <laughs> I don't even want to talk about the other thing now. But well, the thing that bugs me about this, you know, just having this conversation with you is without having heard anyone ever say anything about the movie Haywire, I know that the conversation in review world, it's either going to go, it's going to go one of two ways. It's going to go, this movie sucks, blah, blah, a bunch of stupid stuff that uh -huh. I personally don't care yeah. about, don't want to hear, don't care about. Sure. Or it's going to be a person going, this is a unique and, and amazing blend of the smaller Soderbergh pictures sure. and the bigger ones. It's where you take the cast from Ocean's Eleven, put Sasha Gray in the middle of it, and then kill off the cast of Ocean's Eleven one by one. Right. But I mean, <laughs> it. you know, I have to say it because it's true. It it's is fucking true. true, man. You know, there is a natural tendency to look at his movies and think... Which is this? Yeah, I mean, we have the RT stuff, we have the commercial stuff. When are they going to combine into a perfect thing? Gus Van Sant, we yeah, have the, the same thing. sure. You know, you see his RT stuff, you see his commercial stuff, and you go, eventually, these things might combine into one, one perfect... I believe Not that to was say, called milk. Well, that's it, man. I mean, yeah. and that was the thing people... I do remember that came out, <laughs> and everybody said that. They said he's taking all the RT stuff and building it into a commercial picture. I don't like saying that because I don't feel like there's anything wrong with Ocean's Eleven. Yeah, I, I don't, don't think there's anything wrong with a girlfriend experience. I agreed. I, it's fine keeping those separate, and it seems like I'm being set up to say uh -huh. put them together. Having said all of that, it's it really. I mean, I see Haywire, and it's everything I love about the big budget spy stuff. Yep, and it's everything I love about the these people have not been in sure. other movie stuff. Right. Oh my 
God. Well, and it's got a little bit of our favorite little uh, thing on it. It's got this exploitation factor. Did you see the trailer for Haywire? I haven't. I knew nothing about Haywire. You told me to see it, and I just watched it. Okay, so the trailer for Haywire is all of the fight scenes where Gina Carano uses her MMA skills to kill people. Oh, God. And then guns. That's the trailer. The trailer is guns and fighting, and then it says Haywire. So they're billing it like an action film. Oh, yeah. Because it is an action Uh film. Um, The, uh... Okay, so... Movie opens. Yeah. You get that diner scene. Yep. And this is this is what I'm talking about, man. It's this <laughs> perfect kind of, it's big budget action, but it's shot in the way that you shoot bubble or yeah. traffic, sure. you know, that you shoot the girlfriend experience. It's almost like, and it's effective. That's yeah. the, the fucking, yeah. it's not just why not combine the elements because sure. I know how to do both of these things. It's as if you're watching a home video of the fucking spies from the movie sure. flipping out and kicking people's asses. It, it's reminiscent of, um... News from Maine today. Yes. Uh, yes. Cameras yes. outside of a local diner oh, catch, God. and then it just shows, you know, then right. the news anchor switches to live video sure. of these spies kicking the shit out of each other at a diner. It's the thing you're supposed to love about found footage. Yeah. It's the entire concept of that. Right. And this movie's not even showing it off. It's yeah. not even going, oh, well, look what I'm doing here. I it's have not, found footage of I mean, spies. Because it's just as easy to take it. Make it grainier and have the uh, the surveillance camera go left sure. and right and pan <laughs> sure. away from yeah. the fight and then come yeah, back right. and it's in a different scenario. But he doesn't need an excuse. This no. is just how he makes movies. Yeah, he makes movies where it looks like you're shooting it with a you know with a home video camera or a, a cheaper than commercial quality you know kind of setup. The news at nine kind of setup, and it, god damn it, does that work? The fights are. I mean, they're not sexy. They're dirty real. They're sexy because, I mean, they're, they're great, but they're not slick. They're sure. not produced. No. They, uh, they look so realistic. I mean, there's that moment, uh, not just the, the diner, but the thing after that where she corners the guy. Where, they're in Barcelona, right? Uh-huh. It's uh, the first thing. They go to Barcelona. She corners that guy. She's chasing him. She hops up on the wall. Yeah. <laughs> Immediately just fucking pins him from the... I'm making a gesture with yeah. my hand no one can see. Sure. It's awesome. Right. It's awesome because you don't expect it. It's awesome because it's not the same shit you get every time. Sure. You watch enough action movies in a row and action movies in a marathon format, it, it's not like horror where you just see how brutal you can get. Yeah. Action movies do actually wear down oh, as yeah. you watch more sure. and more of them. Because there's only so many different ways you can punch someone. And you there's blow only up so a car, many... it looks like yeah. a car blowing up. So, and that's, that's what Haywire brings to the table that's never been brought to the table before. It brings this thing, I mean, and it's this big, massive, no, it's not, it's one thing, <laughs> and her name is Gina Carano. Okay, we'll talk about Gina Carano, let's do this. So Gina Carano is an MMA fighter. Yeah, You're familiar with MMA fighting. We talked fighting. about the wrestler and MMA yeah. a, a little bit. So right? she's a mixed martial artist, aka one of the most deadly trained human beings on the planet. Sure. They're um, MMA fighters. There was a story a while back in California, I don't know if you heard about this, where a guy robbed a bank. And one of the people behind him in line was an MMA fighter yes. and his two friends like happened to just walk in. Sure. So they just completely without, I mean, the video is hilarious. Sure. Takes no time. Just yeah. Absolutely. The most vicious and well-skilled fighters because they do all of it. Sure. They're Neo. Right. Uh, from the matrix. This and, is also becoming an argument for why concealed carry is awesome. Sure. <laughs> you have regular <laughs> citizens, a building full of people. Most people are good. If all people knew MMA. Yeah. then the good people would beat up all the bad people. Yeah, exactly. So um, she's actually an MMA fighter. And on top of that, she's fucking gorgeous. Yeah. And she's a fucking ridiculously skilled actor. Sure. AKA she's out of everyone's league. Um, <laughs> right. Right. And uh, except maybe Michael Fassbender's league, which sure. uh, we'll talk about a little bit more in Centurion than here. But sure, um, that's fine. So she doesn't do a lot of acting, though. I mean, right. she was in Ring Girls, which is yeah, a thing she's, because of what it is. She's but barely, she barely acts. This but, reminds me of the Zoe Bell thing. It's yeah, almost yeah, like perfect. take a stunt coordinator or a, a stunt double, essentially, yeah. and give them a movie. You know, there's, there's this thing that's, it's always debatable if Soderbergh's method of casting works. Sure. Because he casts these people that are non-traditional actors. Right. And he casts a porn star to fuck, and he casts a fighter right. to fight. And the thing people always say is, oh, their performance is... St-. They said the same fucking thing. Remember we talked about that with yeah. Sasha Gray? Oh, she's a porn star, but she's just fucking people. She can't act. Reviews are the least artistic. If, you yeah. ever, if you've never read a film review, just as an experiment, go read one, and you'll never need to read one again. They make some stupid pun in the title, and yeah. then they're done talking about 
the fucking content of the Haywire? movie. Haywire? Hey, where's my money? <laughs> right. Right. I don't know. Maybe everyone loved this movie. I don't know. Probably not. But uh, you know I always fall for his women. I mean, yeah. Soderbergh cast women in film, and I just go, oh, real people. Uh-huh. I love real people. This is great. But I mean, I think this works, and here's why I think this works. And who cares what I think yep. or what anybody thinks? As always. So this doesn't fucking matter, but I'm going to make my chapters. case for it anyways. <laughs> I think it works because, you know, of course I'm going to say that, but it's different, man. It's yeah. not that archetypical Mia ass kicking woman, sure. but it's also not, uh, we're reinventing Tomb Raider, give it a fragile yeah. protagonist. So they everybody show the, uh, the woman gets raped in the beginning. We all feel sorry for her. She's so emotionally vulnerable. Instead, I mean, we're not playing up the emotional angle. We're not playing up the, I mean, I guess we're kind of playing up the ass kicking, but not in that I'm the boss of everything. No, it's, it's one liner. No, it's the same type of efficient badassery we saw in Taken. Yeah, sure. Where it's not sure. showy, look, I'm the baddest motherfucker right. ever lived. It's if you become a problem, I will put you down. Right. I have something I need to do. Sure. I mean, I would say even less than, because Taken, you know, you think about the Liam Neeson sure. you know, phone conversations. I mean, this is just a super spy doing her job. Yeah. That's all this yeah. is. This is what it would look like if there were fucking super spies and you watched them and they did their job. That's what we're seeing yeah. here. That's the movie you want to make. This is the person you cast for this. Is it really the only... I'm Think still, about it. Yeah. Think, go I mean, through the I don't, film. Wow. Think about all the, you know, the A-list actors. Sure. I'll just name them. I'll do the actor's name. You tell me whether they're a man or a woman. Okay, great. This is good. Michael Douglas. Uh-huh. That's a woman. <laughs> Oh, sorry. I've already spoiled the joke. Okay, yeah. So <laughs> Michael Douglas, great. Antonio Banderas, uh-huh. Michael Fassbender, Channing Tatum, Ewan McGregor, and then um, that other guy who wasn't he in uh, Red State? The, the other guy, guy is the guy in the car. Yes, he's not uh, not a woman. You're right. I there's no think women. Of, the I only mean, certainly the central character. Sure. So. The only women in the film. Uh, there's the waitress. Yeah. And I'm sure there are some women in the background at that party scene. Well, yeah, but that doesn't matter. Right. I mean, the um, the central characters. Of she doesn't this, have a mother. Aren't... I mean, wow. you have man. She is the only female role. She's kicking back. Yeah. It's really intense because I didn't realize it until the second time through. But by the time I'm getting to the end of the film, when she does that thing where she, uh, she kills one of, uh, one of you and McGregor's characters goons in front of her father and he sees her as a monster. Sure. That's the moment where the only woman in the entire film becomes a machine. And the fact that it took that long for a character that is super spy about doing her job. Yeah. To basically make her a force that isn't, I mean, I guess maybe just because you're watching it and you're kind of, you're following her as the protagonist, you feel like there is this softer element to her. Yeah. Because she's a person. She's sure. a human being. You know, when I see her being chased, there is that kind of thing when you you watch a rape revenge film uh-huh. and you're, you know, you're feeling for this main character that doesn't feel static. Right. But by the time you get to the end, the fact that maybe even just internally, instinctively inside yourself, you had some kind of, oh no, watch out feeling. Yeah. Like a doubt. Sure. The fact that you had any doubt at any point yeah. that she could, she's totally got this covered. Yeah. I mean, I almost feel bad about that. Well, you get to the, you get to that conversation uh, with Paul where... Mm-hmm. He says, um, I've never done a woman before. Right. And the response is, oh, don't think of her as a woman. Sure. That would be a mistake. Yeah, you're right. You're right. And the, I mean, that's that's it's very deliberate. Yeah. And it's it's fascinating because that's the kind of thing that you would expect a film to call out or expect to be obvious in a film. Sure. But because she's such a big character and she's the central focus to everything, you never realize that it's an entirely man's world, say, sure, sure. until you look back and realize that the only people that she's kicked the ass of are men. Well, the movie doesn't have time for those considerations. Yeah. Well, you it's know, because it, uh... it, it the film basically just brings up a bunch of stuff and expects that you will go onto your podcast and talk about it for 25 minutes. <laughs> it's great how, you know, Gina Carano, amazing. Yeah. My other favorite amazing thing about Haywire is you are watching, especially the scenes with Michael Fassbender, oh, yeah. you're watching a spy's world that has no consideration for you. Mm-hmm. You are uh, seeing how two incredible spies talk and act when undercover. Sure. And it has this respect for the audience in that you don't need you know, the novice to enter the scene yeah. and have things explained. There's, uh, you know, They're having these conversations on the phone. And there's always somebody in one of these movies, not necessarily, you know, like the outsider thing we talked about on the Cronenberg uh, episode. Yeah. But just that thing where someone makes a mistake or goes, we can't talk about this on the phone. Someone might be listening. Call me back on another line. Mm -hmm. You know, we can have a movie full of spies, 
but there is always some kind of moment where we go, oh, no one understands spy shit. Let's, yeah. you know, clue everybody in. We never get that really deliberate type of this room is bugged or we have to get out of here and talk somewhere else. It's, uh, it's rare we ever get anything but the insider look. Right. This is kind of fly on the wall. This is how spies would actually act. You're right. just, you are right there watching them at the peak of their game and the movie doesn't slow down to go, oh, let's show people how to come into a spy's world. Right. I mean, it's it even disregards you when um, they're setting up the whole deal and they use the straight up, you know, the lingo. Yeah. You know, I'll forgo the hazard bumps if you remove sure. the, what is it, the necessary necessary materials clause or whatever. Thank you for having that kind of respect for the audience. Yeah. Thank, like, we can we can get that. And if yeah. we can't, then it's lost on us and yeah. fuck us. Well, you know, we'll you say that and it's just, yeah, immediately you go, okay, this is... This is a real spy world. This <laughs> sure. isn't spy kids for grown ups. Right. Despite Antonio Banderas. All grown up. Well, he is a super spy in this. Look at the size of his mustache. <laughs> right. That's how you know. <laughs> the uh it, you know, the the thing that that accomplishes is it lets the spies play steps and steps ahead. It's beyond even just realism. It's showing the pinnacle of what a spy movie could accomplish. If we always just dove in, not quite Mission Impossible style, not quite Ocean style, mm -hmm. but instead we just went, let's cut to the climax of Oceans and make an entire movie out of that. Yeah. Let's cut to the part where we've already got all the setup, and now we're just watching how these things operate. We're kind of shadowing them as they do their job, yep. and we're seeing as much as these movies could accomplish if they didn't have to, you know, if they didn't think they had to talk down to us. Sure. That kind of respect for the audience is something we used to hit on in movies a lot. And we haven't talked about it a lot because, you know, one, we already talked about it a lot in the beginning uh -huh. of the show. And two, I mean, you and I naturally love those movies. So yeah. we just give them the, the credit of talking about them. We like put them they, on double feature. Yeah, that's just the thing is the conversation needs to be had. And so we have it. And that's our way of going. And they give an incredible credit to the audience. Yeah. But this movie, I mean, it does it so it really does. so well and so much. <laughs> uh -huh. You know, I can't think of a, a time recently we've watched a movie that just so boldly went, the audience will figure it out. Yep. We don't have time for that. We're doing this other thing. Just go for it. Right. Well, and that's, the, that's kind of another one of those moments where the independent Soderbergh pops out, mm -hmm. where he's not making, you know, a movie that explains the heist. Yeah. He's making a movie that reveals the world sure it's just as much begging you to try to follow as it is revealing itself in the only subtle and realistic ways that it should well and you know you talk about revealing the world i mean one of the things i think about with soderbergh and again that marriage of the the two things yeah. is he's a guy who has a lot of really interesting camera technique oh yeah and you know the you've seen that play up commercially in things like the oceans movies or be toned down a little bit in things like Aaron Brockovich, right? Mm -hmm. Just kind of judging the level of, you know, where he, how much of that he needs can get away with. Right. What, you know, would fight the commercial success of something. Uh, in this movie, I feel like he's using a lot of these artistic camera things he does to better inform the world, to instill a sense of thing, to tell you your place as an audience member without needing to spell that out. Mm -hmm. You know, he puts the camera in a place that says, okay, you're the audience, you're in that place. When you watch her running around, the camera isn't right with her, uh, maybe crank style. Yeah. Or, you know, like it would be in a highly, you know, slickly produced action yeah. movie to go, you're right there, your camera's landing with the punches. Instead, you're standing back, you know, in the diner on the floor, terrified, crawling away from yeah. these people who are really fighting. Or your, um, you know, the the scenes where she's running away, evading people. The camera's sitting up on somebody's balcony. Mm -hmm. You know, you are up on a balcony just watching this thing from a world you're not a part of that happens to be going on. Or you're under a, uh, you know, a cement block or something. I mean, there's a lot of things that are just stylistic, like the, you know, he's using a lot of wide angle uh, sure. stuff or the the kind of vignetted, the burned yeah. uh, edges, the silhouettes in the airplane hangar. You know, right. scene, talking to Michael Douglas, sure. I really like. And uh, Dutch Angles are another one, too. But, I mean, that's, you know, it's stylistic stuff. But there are things where the camera, it's those vantage points, especially, where I feel like that's where he's addressing the commercial audience. If I can get really fucking metaphorical and artsy on you for a second. He's addressing the audience by going, I'm putting this camera in a spot where a normal person would stand yeah. to go, hey, normal person, 
I see you hanging out over there. Yeah. I know your place sure. and, and how you fit into this thing. Here. Right. So he's not, he's not outcasting the audience. It's an even greater yeah. respect. He goes, hey, you and me aren't spies. Right. So I'm going to stand over here with you with the camera. Yeah. And we're just going to look in on what they're doing. It's almost kind of this weird thought experiment of what if all the people who haphazardly caught the bits of this film yes. just by being around yes. all got together and just talked about what they saw. Yeah. And it's one person well, going, well, I just saw this woman running down the street. Yeah. Exactly. And then I saw, I saw a woman come around the corner and she got into a cab. Exactly. And they're just... One at a time, chronologically, just talking about the sure. brief moments in something they didn't understand. It makes you feel like an observer yeah. of these things because that's the place you know you want to be. That's how you want to be thinking about this movie as an audience member. Right. So it's a little bit more of a subtle thing he can do. I mean, there's you know I think about the scene on the balcony because of the way the camera. It's sitting there. It's showing one side of the street and then it pans over to another side of the street, and the focus is far out there on the street but out of focus physically closer to the lens closer to the camera is somebody's fucking laundry or yeah, something right so it's it's actually glancing over that in a way that almost seems accidental yeah. i mean it's totally intentional sure. but it's going oh you know you're really immersed in this spy thing if you stop for just a second you realize i'm just standing here doing laundry right and there happens to be spy stuff going yeah. on over there and it does it in a way that's just blatant enough that I think, I mean, you know the scene. I know the scene. We haven't talked about this, but we can now discuss this because it's just obvious enough to make you for a second stop and go, oh, yeah, the camera is putting us up on all these weird ledges and yeah. stuff, isn't it? Oh, that's kind of interesting. Oh, wait, back to the spy stuff. Yeah. So it's having that impact on you. It's not directly saying anything to you. It's just giving you the feelings. To go back to, you know, the scene where she's leaving the hotel. And she's just had that conversation uh, and, you know, people are all trying to find her. You are suspicious of every fucking extra yeah. in the background yeah. of that scene. Every car that moves, everybody yeah. that walks by. Yeah. She's dead center in the fucking frame. You should be looking at her. She is the only thing yeah. in focus. The only thing in focus. Uh -huh. And she's in the middle of the frame and there's just tons of room. And still you're going, who's that guy back there? Yeah. What's that car doing over there? Sure. You know, that van's... You're thinking about the van. Yeah, the camera's not focused on yeah. the van. Nothing is telling you yeah. to look at the fucking van, but I'm watching the background so closely, I couldn't tell you what she's been doing for you know two minutes straight. Yeah. There's that famous... Because you're not looking. I don't know if you've ever seen it. It's a video of people playing basketball, and in the middle of the video, a gorilla just walks through the frame. And it's kind of a psychological experiment. People can look it up. I'll try and link to it. But most people don't notice a guy in a gorilla suit walking through the frame. And, you know, I won't go into a big thing about it, but that's a lot of what the movie's doing is it has a central figure right in the middle. She could, you know, be eating a funny looking sandwich and I wouldn't have even known because I'm so distracted by right. these other elements that the film has really subliminally told me that I need to be. I mean, I guess they directly told me uh, somebody might be following her. Sure. But, uh, man, I'm just so immersed and the, the camera's fucking done that and I, I'm blown away from by this movie yeah. i don't even know what to say well and talk about utter respect there's that fucking end moment where she drops from the ceiling antonio banderas oh, goes god shit yeah and the film goes you know what happens yeah you've seen right. her kick enough ass you know what she's out for oh perfect how about some credits just haywire perfect i'm just, oh, my favorite thing ever let's talk about centurion so centurion is neil marshall in a level of beauty only seen in the establishing shots of the descent <laughs> all right so hold on a second Neil Marshall. We yeah. haven't done all his films? No. Well, fortunately for me, and unfortunately <laughs> for all of Podmanity, he's still making them. Ah, I remember when people complained about Rob Zombie? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, Neil Marshall. Keep making movies. So, uh, Centurion... So he didn't make Drive. He made Centurion. He didn't make Drive. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and now we have it on the show. Right. And Centurion is a film um, with two, three key elements. Um, mm -hmm. One is a helicopter. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, one is uh, Michael Fassbender, and one is the idea of historical fiction, yeah. or as we like to call it on Double Feature, based on the truth and lies. Sure. Um, I like to think of everything as alternate reality. Yeah, that's good too. Uh, so I just think of every movie as yeah. telling me that it actually happened, and then I can go, aha, alternate fiction, yeah. this is exciting. Um, what if Hitler survived World War II? Wouldn't everything be all steampunky? That's the actual answer, by the way. Uh -huh. In all of alternate fiction, it Hitler would be survived, and so things would be more steampunky. Fair that's the answer so uh in this in this level of alternate fiction um <laughs> sure. we have um 
the it's the it's the Romans versus the Picts back in way back when people were fighting with swords. Sure. Um, violently fighting with swords. Right. You mean um, in 2006 when yeah, 300 right. came out? Yeah. Um, this film is is gorgeous. It's ridiculously massive, sweeping shots of Ireland and sweeping shots of you know all of these different mountains sure. and snow and rivers sure they even do these showing off shots um that double as establishing and the characters moving you know yeah. what i'm talking <laughs> right. about where it follows the waterfall up goes over you the cliff it. and oh they're just running yeah it's supposed to illustrate the breadth of being trapped behind enemy lines without a fucking radio sure that's uh that's the film yep it all starts in i guess rome it starts neither at the beginning nor the end yeah in uh, a very short Flying Tom Tom. Yeah, with a flying Tom Tom. <laughs> okay, so flying Tom Tom from the Million Dollar Hotel. Yeah. A scene where Tom Tom's a flying, and we're <laughs> going to get back to that later in the movie. Please try and forget about it so we can surprise you. Right. This is a mechanic we've uh, we've talked about before. Yeah, and this is a particular flying Tom Tom that also doubles as our bookends. Yes. He opens the film running through the snow, and he's bleeding, and he's tied up. And Blood he on says, the snow. Hooray. Yeah. And he says, my name is Quintus Dias. This is neither the beginning nor the end of my story. And you think, ooh, poetry. Yeah, right. And that maintains throughout the film. Sure. And we'll get to that and why sure. that works. But then it goes back and you see the beginnings of Quintus Dias in this story. And you sure. see him being tortured and captured and failing and losing. And he escapes. And then you see that thing from the beginning of the film and you're, what, 15, 20 minutes in? Right. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's not much of a flying tom-tom. Right. It flies uh, into the second More chapter of, a hopping, of the movie. Hopping yeah. Tom Tom. Sure, that's fine. And that's kind of this interesting moment where you realize that this character's story is different than the arc of the story. Yeah. The story is about, you know, this war and these soldiers trapped behind enemy lines. But that is just a. The story of Centurion, the story of the fucking film is only a part of the character's story. Sure. Which is something they never touch on in films. You never really think about the fact that the characters in films are alive for 30 sure. years sure. before they turn on the camera yep. and 40 years after they yeah. turn the camera off. Yeah, so this is just a brief period. Right. And before we talk about the actual story of Centurion and the war and everything, I think we need to talk about Quintus. Yes. And there is no talking about Quintus Dias without talking about a one Michael fucking Fossbender. Yeah, this is a guy that I thought uh, was just one of those actors I didn't know. Mm -hmm. That I had seen a bunch of movies he was in, and I needed to sit down at some point and find out, you know, the classic Fossbender and where he came sure. from and all that. And then you realize you've seen everything he's in. He's kind of new. Yeah. He's a, a name that I just became aware that people were talking about, sure. and he was showing up in a bunch of stuff. Yeah. And I didn't realize that... I'd seen most of his yeah, stuff if I would of, just fucking think back. You know, he... Pops so he was, up in 300. Yeah. Um, before that, he did Band of Brothers. I yeah. think that was the big HBO thing. Uh, 2001, something like that. But I mean, I don't think there was a whole lot until 300. Yeah. And that was in this period of maybe five years of Michael Fossbender just doing a ton right. of fucking movies. Well, that was immediately followed by his Inglorious Bastards role. Sure. Which is actually really interesting because Michael Fossbender produced and directed a stage adaptation of Reservoir Dogs where he played Mr. Pink. No way. Really? Yeah. So I had no idea. I'm thinking that's where Tarantino sees him. And once Tarantino wow. pays attention to somebody sucking Wait, Tarantino's dick. Sure. Do you know when that was? It was, it was back... Um, I mean, he was still living in England. Uh -huh. It was back um, before 300, even. Oh, man. This was very early on in his career. So either 300 or Inglorious Bastards is probably the moment of notoriety. Right. Absolutely. 300, he had long hair in 300. Yeah. I, I didn't even recognize right. him until well, I went he, back. And... He says, um, uh, well, there's two versions. In the rated R version, he says, then we will fight in the shade. But in the PG version, he says, then we will hug in the shade. Sure. Bees. And so from, you know, those humble beginnings... He starts doing everything that's great in film. Every notable film that comes out following that. He does what? Hunger, Shame, Prometheus, sure. Dangerous Method. Well, and he also has these notable... I mean, when you think about Inglorious Bastards, that undercover fucking bar scene. Yeah. I mean, you know, perform that experiment. Talk to somebody who's seen Inglorious Bastards and go, name three really good scenes from that movie. Uh -huh. Just a fun thing. Just name three scenes. It'll be a scene with Aldo. It'll <laughs> yeah. be... 
a scene with Hans Landa, and it'll be the scene in the bar. Yeah, it's interrogation's got to be one of them in uh-huh. the beginning, and the bar scene has yeah. to fucking be one of them. And then probably that's a bingo. Oh, I was just thinking that, too. Yeah, I mean, so, you know, he has that, uh, that moment that's really incredible in there. And then, we haven't mentioned this, but I mean, fucking X-Men. Yeah. And he's in first class. There's this, if you don't care about comic book movies, which, by the way, is totally fine, but there is a movie starring the X-Men that's set in the 60s. Uh-huh. And he plays fucking Magneto. How yeah. do you not see that movie? Right. He plays Magneto. Set in the 60s. Yeah. It's about the X-Men. Yeah. It's, Did I mention it's set in the 60s? It's, Who doesn't go to that? Probably one of the strongest Marvel films to ever come out. It's easily one of the strongest Marvel films in the fandom oh. because you can't be, there's not basically cause there's not enough of it in sure. the actual comics sure. for it to betray too much. Right. Um, well also to go, Hey, isn't this great? It's a great movie. I promise it's great. And it's not a Brian Singer movie. And yeah. you go, really? It's a good X-Men movie without uh-huh. Brian Singer. Sure. And it's set in the sixties. And right. Michael fucking Fossbender plays Magneto. Anyways, and then Dangerous Method, too. The, well, right, the plus, thing. not to mention, First Class is directed by Matthew Vaughn, who did Kick-Ass. So, oh, there you go. This is the moment where we realize that Michael Fassbender only does films directed by notable directors. There and you this is it. a wonderful moment for me, because I get to tell everybody who ever said Neil Marshall wasn't notable to fuck off. <laughs> there you go. So you have Neil Marshall, you have David Cronenberg, you have Ridley Quentin Scott. Quentin Tarantino, Quentin Ridley Tarantino. Scott, Zack Snyder. Holy crap. Matthew Vaughn. Holy crap. But there are other people in the movie, there I are. guess. Yeah. Um, there's Dominic West, uh-huh. who was uh, Detective McNulty in The Wire, which will always be the most notable thing he's done, I guess. Oh, wasn't Dominic he in the West. Punisher War Zone? <laughs> he, he was Titus in 300. Maybe it's just a bunch of actors from 300. But I, you know, I, I don't want to talk about McNulty. I want to talk about female characters. Uh-huh. Of course I do, because it's me and it's double feature. Well, and... And it's Neil Marshall. Exactly. Don't worry, I was getting Okay. That. It's Neil Marshall and the ladies. Olga Kuryenko plays um, Etain, the she-wolf. Yeah, she does. The, uh, you know, she's this mute scout. She is... So, first of all, when we talk about women being awesome on Double Feature, uh-huh. I guess this is a bad example because we just talked about Haywire when yeah. we, were, we were trying to hold up, oh, this woman doesn't say much and she kicks ass sure. and she's... Plays it straightforward and isn't that great. But a lot of times it's the more complex characters or people who aren't falling in. I mean, that's it's one of my favorite things personally. I I think that probably goes for you too. When you have a female character that's drawn up in a way that isn't the exact fucking same as every, you know, one of three female archetypes. The only female archetypes we tend to fall generally in love with are the femme fatales. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's yeah, that is the one. But Neil Marshall gets this free pass at just creating flat, easy female warrior uh-huh. because he did the descent. Yeah. And after you do the descent where you go, oh, I'm going to write eight totally different female characters. Then for the rest of your life, yeah. you can just go, this one has a bow. Yeah. And you'll go, yeah, I know this guy's okay with women. Sure. So I'm just going to enjoy the thing he's created here. But if you look at Attain, her motivation is so fucking dark that oh, it is. Yeah, all sure. you need, I mean, that's what I think is wonderful about Neil Marshall going, yeah, she kicks ass. That's her thing. She kicks yeah. ass is because she kicks ass for a while. And then you go, here's why she kicks ass. Sure. Can you actually question her kicking ass now? You know, you can have this character in this movie, and I'm not saying he gets a pass at making a simple no, character. Right. I'm saying I believe that a simple character exactly. is what's called for. Exactly. I will take his word for it because he did the descent, yeah. and that's really enough for me. She plays this role where she's, um, you know, you think of her like a Roman god, yeah. right? She just represents fucking revenge in its yeah, purest absolutely. way. Absolutely. You know, you find out that, th- I mean, her, her tongue's cut out. Yep. That's part of her character. Mm-hmm. She's mute. And her family was killed in front of her. She's been raped. Right. I mean, she has gone through it. She's just a living weapon. Yeah. I mean, they talk about her like she's a legend. Yeah. Like she's a fucking Roman sure. goddess. And when the characters come up against her, they're coming up against this impossible force. Yeah. There's only, I mean, there's a very brief period in the, the movie where you don't know who her character is sure. and what she's about. And you get that fake out, like you might have this mysterious whatever, maybe double crossing, maybe it's a femme fatale thing. A rogue. Right? The doomsday thing. Yeah. Right? There was another example of Neil Marshall doing that straightforward Uh underworld Mia kind of, you know, kind of character. And, you know, embracing what we had a conversation about doomsday. People can go listen to that. But here, he's doing a character that at first glance, 
could look similar to that yeah, character. Yeah, absolutely. But instead, she is the, you know, once you find out that turn, yeah, you also lose that whole mysterious whatever. Uh-huh. It's more like, uh, no, that's just who she is. Sure. That whole doesn't have a background, doesn't have a personality, doesn't talk. Uh-huh. You find out that's not a bunch of mystery for you to figure out who she is and her personality yeah. and get to know her. She's just a goddess. Yeah. She is a mythical creature. Sure. She's a fucking beast. Sure. That, you know, that has right. to be overcome. That's her role. And it's right when you find out about the missing tongue in the background. Yeah. That's also about when you find out, you know, everything that's happening with her character. That cements who she yeah. is. And the thing that's amazing about the character of Attain is that she is slaughtering these you you're basically introduced to these seven characters you know the seven soldiers yeah and she's slaughtering the only characters you're really allowed to get to know sure and every time she kills one you're a little hurt you're a little upset because the numbers are so small and they're so stacked against these people yeah and you really want to see them win every time she kills one you hate her a little more sure and yet when quintus is about to kill her you just wish you just hope so much that she'll just talk and he'll be able to basically go on behalf of Rome. I apologize. Right. Please let me go. Right. And he'll appeal to the humanity and she's desperately human. That's sure. the thing. She's not a monster. Sure. She's so desperately human, but they can't talk. There's this massive cultural disconnect. They're sure. from two different worlds. And when he kills her, a part of you dies. Right. I mean, you have seen this unstoppable killing machine and every time she kills somebody, you hate her, but you also understand why. Sure. And I mean, that's why I go with goddess. Yeah, when you think perfect. about mythically, you think about these, you know, Greek gods, Roman yeah. gods, they represented, they spoke on behalf of humanity. Yeah. They represented facets of humanity. Uh-huh. They In were idolized case, for what they did perfectly. You got it. You got it. And so she is a perfect killing machine. It doesn't make her human, but it gives her this connection to humanity. Yeah. Where she is this, she's this facet. She is this uh, all of rage. All exactly. Of, I mean, it's not an accident she can't speak. She sure. becomes an abstract. Yeah. You know, you invest in her this kind of whatever it is. I mean, hate or revenge or oppression. She becomes the thing that yeah. you have to topple to succeed. Yeah. And the way you have to topple, apparently not just attain, but anybody in this film is through gratuitous fucking violence. Yeah. Well, so the big question for me coming to Centurion for the first time was, can you make a splat pack film with medieval weapons? Yeah. Is that what this is going to be? Right. And the answer, uh, it comes in, in one really basic way that eventually trickles down into a bunch of, I believe sure. Centurion would be a hundred bloody ways. Okay. But the, uh, the method of making a splat pack film out of medieval carnage is cutting the head in half from like <laughs> about at the nose Yeah. and uh, not fully decapitating oh, a person, God. but half decapitating well person. that's where you get that awkward little string of flesh that yeah it's the oh jeez, man <laughs> you know i it's a stupid question can you make a, a splat pack the better question is why has no one made a medieval right. splat pack movie? <laughs> it's so good because you think horror conventions if you think all right go do a horror movie uh-huh you think well i said it in the woods and i have a big guy with the mask yep. and a, you know i mean this is sure. what you think about horror you think high tension you, you know. think cabin in the woods is what you think yeah i mean you don't think um swords and axes right which turns out makes the bloodiest fucking thing uh-huh. ever is swords and fucking axes right. well and you get this whole thing where you know the film is going to be violent they cut quintus's chest in the beginning sure and the setup for that first battle finally comes and they're in the forest foggy as shit and one of my favorite iconic moments happens before Mm -hmm. the massive carnage of that first battle sure which is when they they form up and it's quiet and the captain the general Mm -hmm. says uh whatever comes through that fog hold the line and at that moment you know whatever comes through that (laughs) fog is one going to be horrible the worst thing ever and two impossible to hold the line against sure sure. so you're sitting there going maybe they're riding dinosaurs maybe maybe uh they have a tank sure you're trying to figure out what neil marshall's going to do maybe it's just the crawlers from the descent could be the least ferocious wolves ever filmed right (laughs) The, uh, the docile uh Ironic from the guy who did the movie Dog Soldiers, right. but, you know, harmless puppies yeah, who we're sure. terrified of. Instead, it's 
what, 20 flaming boulders? Yeah. It's amazing. Fuck? <laughs> it's so amazing. Didn't see flaming boulders coming, but I guess that's why they're shrouded in And fog. that's where you get this, uh, it's the moment where you realize that it's um, the same thing. It's v the Vietnam War. It's the Irish versus the English. Yeah. Which there's a lot of parallels to in this film where you get these people who are organized warfare mm -hmm. fighting guerrilla warfare. Yeah. And that is where, and if, if you know anything about history, those are the bloodiest battles. Sure. The ones where the rebels come out of the fucking woodwork. Yep. And the people who don't know how to fight out of formation. Sure. Just get slaughtered. Well, that's the thing, man, is you have people who go in and they have fucking armor and they're trained. Yeah. And when two groups of people have armor and they're trained... Then neither one of them goes down very quickly. Yeah. I mean, unless one is just blatantly better than the other. Uh-huh. But when you have a lot of people, I mean, guerrilla warfare, those people don't have armor. Yeah. They have sticks that cover their chest. Sure. And also, the other side that has all the fucking armor is not prepared for the guerrilla warfare. Uh-huh. So both sides are just fucking dying exactly. everywhere. Exactly. Just exactly. left and right. And it's, it's this ridiculously vicious environment. And that's the thing. It's called Century. And you know there are 100 soldiers. And if you know anything about the film, you know that there are seven for the right. majority of the film. Sure. So you know that at some point in the film, there will be a scene where 93 people die. Sure. And that scene is bloody and in every bit of wonderment to the Neil Marshall splat pack saga. What you would come to expect. One of those other people, before we just gloss over what becomes the, the, the little the ending. The other, the other 93%? Well, there's Tammy at yeah. the fucking, you know, from 28 Weeks Later. Uh-huh. Um, oh, yeah. Who we have a half hour left. Let's introduce a likable woman right. so they're sure. not all warriors. Right. Yeah, just she's a witch, maybe. A, yeah, sneak in a little thing at the end to, to, go, to go back to what that thing you were saying, where these characters have these lives. Yeah. And we just see a small portion. Right. Tammy just happens to be around, you know, toward, yeah. toward the end there. Well, and, and yeah, she's really good, and she brings up a lot of stuff in the film, but the thing about Centurion, and I mean, the meat of the plot, and we rarely cover plots on Double Feature, because who the fuck cares? It's that you have these seven people, and they're the survivors. I mean, they have right. lived. Right. They are going to survive. Sure. Nothing can stop them. Liam Cunningham, I mean, he gets he gets to a point in battle where he's killing people with the weapons that they stab him with. Yeah. Um, these are survivors. Sure. But it just goes to show that even with the seven survivors, all it takes is one fucking guy to just... I mean, the only reason they're even being followed is because one guy kills a child. Sure. And that guy becomes the worst human being right. on the planet. <laughs> right. And anytime somebody might survive, he makes a selfish move. And it's kind of... it. Basically, you watch him whittle down the characters just as well as Etain is whittling down the characters. Right. I'm talking about uh, Thax. Yeah. That fucking guy. Um, and he ends up living almost all the way till the end. Mm -hmm. You You fortunately get to see Quintus wonderfully destroy him. Right. But it's this weird thing where you watch who are supposed to be your protagonists. They have an inside man who's on. I mean, he's sure. not necessarily on the bad guy's side, but he's on he's on the side of entropy. Right. right. He's on the side of chaos. He's chaotic evil. To go back once again to this idea of, you know, Roman myth. I mean, you have to have the traitor. Sure. That's yeah. kind of a classic uh, theme to a yeah. lot of tales of legend and myth. Yeah. Well, I mean, he's the, I mean, it's, uh, it's not Roman or it's not Greek mythology, but sure. uh, he's Loki. Yeah. He's the mischievous God who sure. comes in and, and just does tiny little things that end up right. ruining the whole thing for everybody. Sure. I'm not talking about Avengers Loki. I'm talking about actual Loki. Right. Um, Gods who never get their feet wet. Loki. Sure. I love that too. That just little moment of... Um, you know, it's easy to turn to the gods for salvation, but yeah. the soldiers do all the fighting. So or beautiful. The, the gods never get their fucking feet wet. Which brings me back to, I mean, the best point to end on the film, which is the same thing we started with, where you have this voiceover, and it's wonderfully poetic because Fassbender can do nothing wrong. Right. But it also goes to show that Neil Marshall is not just a fucking stab and slash. He can sure. write this poetry that illustrates these high... I mean, it, how beautiful does it portray the failings of war and the failings yeah. of wartime yeah and then it ends on the same note it begins where you think okay well quintus has been poisoned and he's on his way out and sure. okay well he's gonna die in the hands of his witch right and then he says the line which is also by the way in you know we're talking about a flying tom tom you could do the lazy thing yeah. the reason flying tom tom is a term because people just fucking put it in their goddamn movie uh-huh 
and not even necessarily, you know, a million dollar hotel, which was our origin point for yeah. that. But a lot of times you chalk these things like hamster style sure. in your movie because I don't know, I didn't really have anything special yeah, and easy to put in the movie. Yeah. But the scene comes back. The quote does not come back till the end. Right. So that scene, you know, you were, you noted earlier, it's like 15 minutes or uh -huh. fucking whenever it is that it just shows up again in the beginning. But the quote comes back around at the sure. end. We're not ending the, this isn't bookends. No. It's, uh, we've separated the bookend and the flying Tom Tom yeah. mechanism. They start in the same scene. They finish in different spots. Well, and the best part is that you may call it a bookend because it starts and ends with the same line. But the line is, my name is Quintus Dias. Right. And this is neither the beginning nor the end of my story. The website is doublefeatureshow.com and the email address is doublefeatureshow at gmail.com. Send us an email and tell us how much you liked uh, Haywire or Centurion or more likely both or most likely that you saw neither of the films and <laughs> just spoiled yourself. All of the things we referenced on today's show, you can go back into the older shows and find that stuff. Uh, especially The Descent, if you want to oh, yeah. look over that little Or any other Neil Marshall. Terrible really. year one episode of Double Feature. Uh, what are we What are we gonna try and do next time? Maybe on double feature if we don't talk too much. Give me something easy. Give you something easy. Yeah, you okay. got two two simple films. That... Yeah. All right. Let's do uh, Gummo and Pink Flamingos. That'll be really I fun. Really easy. Hate you. Are we actually doing Pink Flamingos? Is that really a? Oh yeah. I don't remember writing that in the schedule. Yeah. Is that no, a... it's happening. That's really a thing that's mm -hmm. happening. Yeah. Fought that so, for uh... so long. I'm just afraid of it. I'm afraid. Don't be afraid of it. Gummo's not going to be any easier. Papa Umau Mau, watch more fucking film. I'm afraid.